And away we go. It is the BCJ podcast presented by the Holy Grail right here on BearcatJournal.com. If you're looking for a spot to watch the NFL playoffs this weekend, you get yourself down to the Holy Grail, get some great food, have some good drinks. And guess what? For every Cincy Light you buy at the Holy Grail, they will donate an additional 50 cents to the Cincy Reigns Foundation to support the NIL endeavors of the Cincinnati Bearcats. So make sure you are taking care of the people that take care of us and get yourself down to the Holy Grail. Order yourself some Cincy Light and have a great time. All right, let's get this show on the road. We have a big one tonight. It has been a big week. We get Nico on Monday. We get a big home win over TCU last night. Two live shows. Not one, but two live shows last night. Tonight, we get another awesome guest, a special guest, one that I'm sure he's going to bust my chops for something here shortly. <laughs> but it is uh, it has been too long. He's been here too long to have not done this. So he was uh, our first priority as we get into to having some, some of the staff on this offseason. We bring in offensive line coach Nick Cardwell. Coach, welcome to the network. Appreciate it, man. Do you know how many times people have thought that I am Nico? <laughs> like it is, it is a constant thing. My wife went to sign up my daughter for. I thought you were going to say your wife thought you were Nico. No, absolutely not. <laughs> my wife went to go sign up my daughter for like one of the cheerleading things in Cincinnati, and I think the cheerleading coach was like, "Oh, your husband's the strength coach," and she goes, "No," and he goes, "Well, if it's not the strength coach, it's definitely the O line coach." <laughs> <laughs> it's the beard. It's the beard. I, I guess what it is, man. But Nico's awesome, man. He's great. He is great. He, he, uh, so Brady, when Brady, I don't know if you know Brady or not, Collins. Um, Brady used to do every other week in the offseason. He would do every other Monday. Oh, I got you. That's and, the, uh, oh, the former, uh, strength coach. Yeah. Oh, the guy that's, he's with Luke now. Yeah. Um, but him and Nico, like, the weird thing is him and Nick, Nico followed him at four or three or four consecutive jobs. Really? So like Brady left, and then Nico would be the guy that got hired to replace Brady. Yeah, at Ole Miss, Ohio State, and here. Nuts. Yeah. So they I never worked met, together. I haven't, met, I haven't met Brady yet. Does he look like Nico also? No. 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 <laughs> Brady's nuts. We love Brady, but Brady's yeah, nuts. Absolutely. Um, you gotta have that. <laughs> you gotta have. You gotta have a little edge about you to where you kind of live in the gray area sometimes you you gotta have that there's no doubt Great. about it. uh brady was the gray area he just existed in it it, it, it engulfed him yes <laughs> but yeah I, I mean i can see it you're about the same size yeah Roughly. i think well how, what do you play i think nico played like fullback at michigan Full, state or yeah. Something like that. Fullback. Yeah. yeah and i played a tight end kind of like a, a fullback um at App State, so it was, it was probably pretty similar uh, to that. You know, not as not as good as Michigan State. I was obviously I was a walk on. Were, were you on the team to beat Michigan? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you so go. That was that was my senior year. Um, Coach Satterfield was the offensive coordinator at the time. Um, it was nuts. It was an awesome time. I, I can only imagine. Yeah, you know what, I forget his first name. Last name was Lynch, right? The guy that returned yeah, the, the Bengals drafted him, I think, in like the sixth or seventh round. Yeah. Like that next year. Yeah. Who so who's this guy? That's Brady. Oh, I got he's, it. Yeah. He's short and full of energy and you know yeah. very prototypical strength coach. <laughs> yes. Yes. Those guys. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, uh Corey Lynch, he was actually my roommate. Um, oh, okay. that state. and, uh, man, he, I'll tell you what, I, every last one of those, um, kicks that we did or field goals in practice or fall camp, he blocked them over and over again. He just had a knack for turning the corner and, and sticking his hands out there and, uh, getting a block. I man, he was top end speed wasn't great, but he could really bend off the edge. And, uh, he did a great job. And, and when we knew they were lining up for the kick to win the ball game, I was like, no way, no way. <laughs> No way they're going to make this. I mean, because we had already blocked one earlier, but no way they were going to make that one. He had that DN dip for a, oh, for a little guy. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He could do it now. He could get it done. And and that at that point, the whole state of Ohio fell in love with us. Oh yeah. <laughs> Ohio, Ohio State was playing our fight song whenever uh, they went against Michigan. There was shirts that said "Where's Ann Arbor." I mean, it was it was incredible. Yeah, you should just walk around town with a shirt that just says like I was on the App State team that beat Michigan and no a lot doubt. of people probably uh would probably like just, you just for that. Just oh, simple. Cool. I beat Michigan. Just yes. Yeah. Right now that's all you gotta say around here. I was on the team. I don't want to say I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Creative Liberty. It's been you, long enough. You and or you and Armani Edwards. Yes. Yes. More so Armani Edwards. <laughs> So you don't. This is a, a great joke in that in Bearcat lore. Uh, do you have you ever heard the name Chuck Mayshock? I have not. I need to know. So Chuck was, and it's one of Bob Huggins' like forever trusted, long time, long time assistants. Well, Chuck played with Oscar Robertson, mm. and they were roommates. And so they they go to Madison Square Garden. And Oscar sets the Madison Square Garden scoring record. He scored like 56 points. Like it was, it was crazy. So Chuck would always tell the story that him and Oscar combined for the That's Madison right. Square Garden scoring record uh, yeah. at 56 points. Oscar had 56 and Chuck had, had zero. Is that guy still around? Chuck, Chuck he passed away. Yeah, uh, three, okay. maybe th pre COVID, probably like 2019, 2018. I got you. I got yeah. you. I, I, he, also got, he also else. got thrown out of an NCAA tournament game as the announcer. <laughs> Did he really? Oh yeah! Oh, in, God, uh, like in, that. in huge first that. round first round game against Gonzaga at uh, in Utah, yeah, he was the ref just comes over and, and throws him out of the game. Well, the ref had tossed Huggins. Yeah, for getting two technicals. Yeah, and Chuck was just letting him have it. So they go to commercial. They come back from commercial and. Chuck has been ejected from the arena. That's great. God. <laughs> I tell you what, there's a lot of pride, a lot of pride in this city for Cincinnati sports. It's not even, and you know what? It's not even like, can you say that? And people think, yeah, the Reds or, uh, you know, the Bengals or the Bearcats. Heck, I went to a uh, St. Xavier, St. X, LaSalle. Am I saying that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, LaSalle yeah. basketball game last Friday. Intense. Yeah. It came down to like the last second, like the last uh, tipped in to, to win the ball game. But the crowd was rowdy. It was loud. I took my son, um, Kai, with me. But it was awesome. I mean, it was great. Well, did either team score, score over 30 was points? It, yeah, that's yeah was it 38, saying. 37? Oh, man, I'd have to <laughs> I'd have to look and see what it was. Well, the, the, so that conference is notorious for like, you score 30, you're going to win. Oh, they don't. They don't play stall ball like it's they, they just beat the yeah. hell out of each other for for th 32 minutes. I have the video of like the last the last second. It's like six seconds to go. Hold on. I got to find it. I'll tell you what the final score was. Because I was. Oh, no. Hold on. No. Yes, sir. It was uh, 54, 53. Wow. Well, wow. High scoring. <laughs> yes, sir. A little tip in a little tip in at the end, uh, end of the game. And uh, that, that's a GCL track meet. Yeah. Especially Moeller. Moeller is like they they'll have one of the best basketball teams in the state every year, but they barely play a game in the in the in the sixties. Really? So we've seen so um also with my son my son does the wrestling program there at Moeller. Uh -huh. Those guys do a great job. Oh, oh I, I can I can imagine. And he's like I mean he's nine. I mean this is young, looks like the little it's like the little kids wrestling, but they get after it. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching. I'm like, this is good. This is good. I like it. You want, you want another funny story? You, you want to know how crazy the pre the previous head coach was here? Need to know. His son went to Moeller. Yeah. He wouldn't. Landon. Landon. Yeah. And then he then he transferred, right? Or he went somewhere else? No, he went to Moeller. Oh, okay. Luke, Luke wouldn't wear anything because it had the, the gold M. Oh, because it had the M on it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, you never would want to see him in anything molar. Yeah. Because it was the colors and he just, yeah, he couldn't do it. Well, yeah, I, I totally forgot. Landon's, Landon's awesome. Landon's been doing good for us too. I mean, he's working his tail off and he's, and he is, 
first of all, our room is incredibly funny. I mean, all offensive line rooms are, are full of comedians. Big guys, just hilarious. Uh, but Landon's definitely one of them that, that stirs the pot, <laughs> that gets it going in there. It seemed like Radosevich was – Oh, it was great. It's one that that like to mix it up. Yes, he he'd mix it up, and he he he'd call people out, and he'd say some stuff that was um, very funny. Um, but he'd get after it pretty good. Now he was he was a good one. He was good. Phil Wilder, comedy. John Williams gets it going a lot. John Williams a lot gets it. I going. covered e- I covered Ethan Green as he was committing to yes. Cincinnati. And yes. that dude is a talker. He's hilarious. Yes, I think at first, I think at first with Ethan, he was kind of a little bit shy because you're getting to know a new coach. Like, who is what? this guy? What, what can I do? And he's a young guy um, at that, so he's trying to figure it out. But he's come out of his shell a little bit more and and, uh, and talk some more. But they've got they've got some funny. I give them like at the beginning of a meeting, we talk, we we play some music at the beginning and kind of get the guys going and kind of you know how's your day going. Try to get get a, get a feel for where everybody's at, and then it just starts, and it just they start going. I'm like, hey, 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 hey! Now can we focus on some football for a little bit? Work, work. Yes. But we have Friday night, so we do Friday night meals on game day. This this might be just my thing, but on game day, on a game day meal, nobody talks. Like, don't say a word. You are focused on your job. I don't want to hear it. No, there's nothing. We are focused on what we're doing. The night before, everybody kind of talks and, and then has a good time. So I, so we sit with the uh, with the O-line, and this is probably one of the first times in my career, two two times I laughed till I about cried, just at these guys telling jokes, making fun of each other, and I I just tears pouring out my eyes. I'm like, guys, I got, we got to stop. We got to stop. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's the camaraderie. It's the chemistry. It's, it's things like that. Um, you know, that you never forget about a group or forget about your time playing ball. You know, it's it's right times in the locker room, it's times you're out there on the field and Nico's destroying you, and you're out there getting crushed. <laughs> um, those are the things you, you you never forget. I think that interview Aaron did, like normally those recruit interviews are like if you can get if you can get them to talk five minutes, yeah, like you've gotten a lot out of a kid. I think that Ethan Green interview was like 44 minutes. Really? He talked like that? Yeah. That kid yeah. don't talk that much. He don't talk like that for me. He does. <laughs> he does some, but I think he's like, I think he might just be worried that the rest of the guys are going to get him. He talked for like an hour and 15 minutes, but the 45 minutes was what I had to transcribe. Really? It was bananas. Well, I'm going to start messing with him then. <laughs> let him let him know. Like, I heard about that hour and 15 minute he interview you did. He'd be more vocal. Yeah, I heard you talk a lot. I'm telling you, he's just like he's right now. He's well, he's actually come out a little bit more. But at first, he's like, "Who is this? Like, well, you know, what's going on? Trying to fill his way out." But no, he challenged. He challenged Fick when he was being recruited to a wrestling match. Ooh, because he was the number one heavyweight in the state at the time. Yeah, and he's like, "I'm gonna get you." And Fick's like, "You're not even in my league." Like. Yeah. I don't even know who you are. Like until you win state, don't talk yeah. to me. Yeah. Come back after you win state, and then I'll put you on a program to work towards me. Did he win? Did he win states though? I think he, he did. did. Ethan he did. did. Senior year. Yeah, I think he got into it with somebody at practice. I'm trying to leave some names out, but I think he got into it with somebody at practice, and then <laughs> and then put him on their back, and then he came over. You know, at the end of practice, you're meeting as O line and. Ask the guys like, "Hey, how was your day? You know what what happened down there on the scout team?" Sometimes he would rotate down there, um, and he said, "He said, he said, so and so tried me." I said, "Don't you know? I, doesn't he know I wrestled?" <laughs> and uh, whoever it was uh, took an L that day. Um, but we, I'm not trying to wrestle him. That is not that's not in my wheelhouse. I'm getting I'm getting too old for that. And that's a pretty big boy. But yeah, he's getting bigger too now. I think he's he's at 300 or over 300 now. Uh, Jason wants to know, did you read the, the Jason, uh, the Travis and Jason Kelsey article today in the athletic? I haven't had a chance to read it. Um, I was driving at probably 50 miles an hour or less from Grand Rapids, Michigan to Detroit 
in uh, what seemed to be the aftermath of a winter storm. And uh, <laughs> what seemed to be what I mean, it was it Did the was, eight inches of snow give it away. It's eight. I wish I was eight. There's <laughs> cars on each side of the road, and then you, you're hitting different slick spots. And I seen one lady spun around. She was probably five minutes ahead of me, spun around and was facing out. Um, it, everything's good. The wind's coming from the right. Everything is good when the trees are lined up. But when the trees and there's like an open space right there, then the snow gets blown over. Yes, the interstate. So then it's on drift. And uh, I was in I was in two wheel high. And then and then I started fish telling a little bit. So then I, I popped it down into four wheel uh, and got across there. But I will read it. I was looking at some of the um, I did see some of it on Twitter. Some of the quotes that were coming out of there, which sounds hilarious and great. Like these boys enjoy like they enjoyed college. As you should. They enjoy everything in life. Both no, of them. And, and why shouldn't? Why shouldn't? Right. You know? Jason Jason notoriously one time ripped somebody's helmet off in practice and launched it like 30 rows up, like almost to the top of the, the first deck. At I love it. it. Nuts. Are you, you Absolutely don't. nuts. You got to have that. You got to have some of that. I mean, you, you got to <laughs> be. I mean, you got to, to play this sport and to – I think to coach the sport, <laughs> you gotta have you gotta have some of that in you that that. And I've told this guy, I've told to the guys before. I said before, you're a player. Before I'm a coach, I'm a man. And if anybody want anybody wants to try me, just let me know. I may or may not win. But you, will <laughs> feel, you will feel every bit of of everything I got. So, well, you got it. You got it. You got to have a little bit of uh, screw loose every now and then. I'm sure those two will be back at some point in time soon. I would love to. I would awesome. love. I would love to have um, Jason come and and talk to our guys. You know, he's. I mean, I'm sure as an O line coach, you've watched him. He, he's. Oh I think he's the best center in history. It's unbelievable. I mean, what he came here playing as a linebacker. Yeah, yeah a walk on linebacker. A walk on linebacker, and just just the things he can do with his body and his and his long arms and the leverage that he plays with and the fluid fluidity in his hips and and all of that stuff it's man it's 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 awesome to watch probably one of the best one of the best to ever do it that is the fact the, tell people the tush push is because of him no question like everybody said if if everybody could do it they would do it the reason they do it yeah I, I watch guys that defenders have lined up with their face mask this far mm -hmm. off the ground and jason still wins yeah and gets under him absolutely it's unreal yeah I mean, and, and just just an incredible competitor, and how long he's been doing it for. We would love, love. I don't even, you know, I don't, I want nothing from you, but I just want you to come talk to the guys. I would love for him just to come talk to the guys for a little bit about his experience, what it takes. I mean, what what it takes. We went to the uh, O line masterminds uh, clinic down in uh, it's Duke Manyweather, who trains probably the first round draft picks offensive lineman down in Dallas. And he has a, uh, a board of guys that come in and talk, and Mark Schlereth is on there. And uh, all these former former players are down there uh, talking and sharing stories. Mark Schlereth goes on there and is like, guys, if you're talking about playing hurt or complaining about playing hurt, I had he had 29 different surgeries. He said oh, yeah. like 15 on his left knee, however many on his right knee, and a bunch on his shoulder. And then he said, he said there was one Sunday night uh, he was in the hospital Monday morning. He checked himself out of the hospital so he could play in a Monday night football game. I mean, just hearing stories like that um, and our guys hearing stories like that on what it really means to be a tough football player goes a long way for any offensive lineman. Dave, you usually run these things. We've gone 20 minutes and haven't talked any ball yet, really. Well, we're what about you got, to Dave? All right, so before we get into this past season and this upcoming season, I want you to help all of us become smarter football fans because I think offensive line play, at least for me, I think I know a little bit about the game, but I know the least amount about offensive line play. So we know you guys, zone blocking team, outside, yes, inside, split, whatever, whatever ways you want to call it, your explanation of what that is and the – Key teaching points that make a good zone blocking offensive lineman. Uh, 
I'll tell you, I, I have been blessed to be around some really, really good coaches. Uh, Dwayne Ledford, uh, who's with the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Sean Clark, who's the head coach at App State. Sean Elliott, who's the head coach at uh, Georgia State. Um, all these guys taught me a ton. <clears throat> we started doing um, pistol wide zone in, uh, I want to say, 2012, 2013. Chris Alt uh, started doing it, started doing pistol at Nevada. Mm -hmm. Nevada we had those yeah. guys come in. We started, you know, we started messing with some of the pistol stuff. We didn't win. I think Sat's first year before we started doing pistol wide zone, we, we were maybe four and eight. Then we started the next year, one and five. We were trying to do everything. Dave. We were trying to do everything. Um, a lot of pin and pull stuff, gap scheme, counter, inside zone, outside zone. We just weren't great at any of it. And so we decided if we're going to be good, let's hang our hat on uh, pistol wide zone. And when I say pistol, that's obviously in the shotgun, but um, the running back's directly behind. That way the, that way the defense, because if you put him offset, then the defense goes, okay, well, the back's here. The run must be going the opposite the other direction. The moment I move him behind the quarterback, they don't know which way the run's going, right? So that's why we we try to do a, little, a lot of that. We're probably about 50-50 pistol and uh, and gun offset. Zone blocking-wise, outside zone, um, we're trying to displace the D-line vertically and horizontally. We are running off the football running off the football. Um, we I used to show a clip at, at some of these um, clinics, and I'd say, who's who's number 99 for the L.A. Rams? And everybody's like, everybody's like, oh, that's uh, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald. I'm like, yeah, it's not just Aaron Donald. Aaron is it's the Aaron Donald. It's, it's a, a multi-year pro bowler. He's number 10 pick from Pitt. He's a fire-breathing dragon. Three-time, I think, defensive rookie of the year. He's a monster, right? And I'd show the clip, and I'd say, uh, and here is number 60 uh, from the San Francisco 49ers, about to have to block uh, Aaron Donald. I said, who's 60 for the 49ers? Everybody's like, I don't have a clue. The guy's name is Daniel Brunskill. Daniel Brunskill was a walk-on tight end at San Diego State, turned into an offensive lineman, undrafted um, free agent rookie, went to Atlanta Falcons, got cut from the Falcons, and then found himself at the 49ers then found himself lined up across from a fire-breathing dragon and Aaron Donald. Don't know exactly how much money uh, Daniel Brunskill is making, but I'm pretty sure Aaron Donald's probably making a whole lot more. And he's like really – Like that much. A, so what? Uh, like that much. Yeah. Like that much <laughs> yes, a lot more. Okay? And so we, I look at it and I go, what run scheme did the 49ers use to displace right here? And that's a clip. It's a clip of him – running off the football, trying to displace uh, Aaron Donald. Now, does he block him five yards down the field? No. He runs with him, and they're on the line of scrimmage, and he and Aaron Donald makes the tackle. It's an arm tackle, but the running back gets four to five yards. Even though he didn't block him four to five yards, it's an arm tackle, four to five yards. If we do that, if you get 45 yards every time you hand it off in the NFL, you've done something special. Very few times do you have a 100-yard rusher or somebody rushing for 200 yards in the NFL. And so we looked at that, and when I look at that, I see somebody who took a lesser athlete and put them up against a, a better, bigger, faster, stronger, and they used a scheme in order to displace him to move the football. All we're trying to do is win one gap. Whether the tackle wins the gap, the guard wins the gap, we insert – a, a tight end, he wins the gap. The center wins the gap. All I'm trying to do on the play side is win the gap um, while moving them horizontally and vertically down the line of scrimmage. The key to, to what I think, um, or there's so many things to it, you got to have a running back with good vision, with good vision. There's a lot of people that want these running backs that, that can go the distance, and I do too. That, that, that'd be great. Somebody who runs a 4-2 a who can dag on, get out of there and go. That's great. But usually those guys struggle to read wide zone. Corey Kiner does a phenomenal job of reading wide zone. He sees the flow of the offensive line. He knows when to stick his foot in the ground and get north and go get you four to five. What I'm looking for, I when when we as the staff, uh, Coach Sims, Coach Step, um, uh, Coach uh, Seth Price, who's our, our, our analyst, our guys on offense who, who really work more so in the box uh, with that, 
we go into each game with 15 runs, 15-ish runs, okay? What we're trying to do is we're trying to get a run that Coach Satterfield can look down at his call sheet and say, I know this will get me four. Let me let me do whatever I can do to get four yards. I mean, second and six is a lot more manageable than second and 12, right? And what we've seen throughout the years is, is wide zone has been that play for us. So we try to do some things, either locking the backside or inserting a fullback in different places uh, to, to, to really create some room uh, for Corey. But Corey does a great job of pressing the line of scrimmage uh, and getting vertical. But to just keep it as, as simple as possible, we are running off the football, trying to displace uh, the D-line horizontally and vertically to win one gap, to cut off one gap on the backside so that Corey can stick his foot in his ground, foot in the ground, and get north. There you go. I'm, I'm much smarter now. Um, that was probably more than what you were asking for. No, I, I love it. I'm Chad knows, our, our members know, like I like to talk the – the X's and O's and, and the truly inside the game stuff. So, no, I love it. Let's go to this year. How would you assess year one from this line? You know, where do you think you guys excelled? And then what are some areas of kind of the main focus of improvement when you really start up in the spring? Well, I think anytime you come out of a season like we just had, um, you, you, you go back and you look at everything. I mean, there's no stone unturned at, at what can we do better um, at every single position, at every part of the program um, is what Coach Satterfield has done. I think I think for me and, and maybe for, for him as well, this might have been the only – this might be the second or maybe third time in, in my career that we've had – that I've been a part of a losing season. Um, so you're looking at everything. Everything is being evaluated. Every player is being evaluated, every snap. Uh, run game, pass game. What? Why do we make this decision? Uh, why do we do this on, on, on this down the distance? What were we thinking here? How can we get better? Um, the, the things that were most pleasing for our guys is, is being able to run the ball. Um, I think um, at, at the guard position, um, Kendra and Tinsley both did a tremendous job on getting uh, movement. You got your cat there, bud. Oh, yeah. She likes to be – whenever I'm on, she <laughs> likes to be on. That's Pickles. <laughs> That's Pickle. She, she's the third host of the show. Yeah, like, she's yeah. like the BCJ mascot. Love it. Love it. Um, I thought the guard position, I thought uh, Gavin did some good stuff at, at the center position. I think our tackles did well um, in the run game, learning how to do what we're asking them to do. Because as much as I can sit here and say, hey, man, we're trying to run off the football and displace somebody vertically and horizontally, it takes time. It takes time, and it takes a lot of work just to get one step. We're always trying to teach guys just to take one step. And we we went back and counted every single rep uh, of wide zone that we took from the time we showed up in January to the time we've got um, to, to the end of the season or even, even getting to the fall. And it was in the thousands of how many times we're trying to rep it uh, to, get, to get better at it. So I think in, in running the wide zone scheme, we did well. I thought inside zone was okay but can get better. And we've got a long, we've got to get a lot better um, in overall pass protection. Um, overall pass protection, I got to do a better job uh, coaching them. Um, and we've got to do a better job of protecting. Um, I, I know, I mean, obviously, you know, we I try not to pay attention to media, but I'm sure Emory um, took a lot of heat last year. Um, but we could have done a lot better job in giving him more time uh, to push the ball down the field. And that's been uh, an area of emphasis uh, for us this offseason. Those guys have been given their evaluation sheets on each one of them, and they have stuff that they're working on even now uh, in the world of, of protection. Um, but it was the best, and, and me and Coach Price, our analysts, talk about this. This was the best um, we've done in a first year of putting in the wide zone system going against four down teams or, or three down teams or whatever it is. Uh, the best we've done in the first year in, in running uh, the football. We just need to do a lot better job up front protecting, um, picking up games, all of that stuff. Uh, we got to do a better job. And our guys know that, um, you know, and then we talk about it all the time. And uh, it's a big part of what we're trying to do um, in this offseason. Uh, I think um, third and short 
we can be better. We can be a lot better at that. And, um, and, and again, scoring touchdowns in the red zone. I think those are the things that, that, that we could work on up front, given, given our guys enough time and being able to say, Hey, it's third and one or it's fourth and goal. Let's go score. Let, let's run the football run behind me. And so those are a lot of the areas. And I think I am, I, I, I me personally, I am hyper critical. Like I, like I am, I, I hate losing. I can't stand it. Um, winning three games is, is beyond disappointing to me. Um, yeah, there was a shining spot and yeah, you're fifth in the country in Russian. That's great. I would rather be last in the country in Russian and win 10 games all day long, all day long. But um, you know, that's how it ended up. And those are some of the things that we definitely are working on in this offseason. With you having, hate losing so much, you'd walk out into the cold and die of hypothermia. And quickly, <laughs> right now. Like that's <laughs> right now. It could, there was a there was a frostbite advisory <laughs> here that said if you're outside for longer than 30 minutes, you are going to get frostbite. Did you see that interview, Rick Patino? No, I have not. Yeah, they, they recently asked Rick, but like after a loss, and he was, I think they lost to UConn or somebody. Yeah. And he was like, I would rather walk out into the freezing cold right now and die than lose. No question. No, <laughs> you, work, you work, you work too hard and it just means too much to you. It means too much to the, to the city, to this program, to what we're trying to do. It's, it's, I, I can't stand it. And so I'm, I'm excited for what we're doing in this off season for what Nico has done with putting these guys in their, in their competition groups and everybody working together uh, on this deal and, and building some leadership and, and changing the culture. Um, I'm excited all about it. You mentioned it a little bit, but having three guys who had never had been here, never really been in that scheme, two, two new guys, what was like, was that transition harder than, than you expected the same as you expected? And then, as you move in, is that the type of thing where you could see a you, you're hoping, but you could see a big jump from year two one to year two just because the newness of it all is gone? Yeah, I, you know what? These guys were so hungry. Like in, in the O line room, you, John Williams, um, who's who's a backup. You know, he probably had a chip on his shoulder. He felt like he should have been playing. Uh, D'Artagnan Tinsley, same thing. Felt like he should have been playing. Uh, Gavin Gearhart, um, he was a starter. Uh, Luke Kandrew was a backup for me at Louisville. Um, Deion Buford was a back, excuse me, a backup in Kentucky. All these guys with a chip on their shoulder uh, with something to prove every single practice. And they, they wanted it. I mean, from the moment we walked in the door and started talking about what we're going to do, and the, and the first thing I told them, I said, I said, we're going to win. I said, I said, the Joe Moore Award is the best offensive line in the country. I said, that's that's what we want to be. We want to be the best in the country. And that's what we're going to strive through for every single day. There's no doubt about it. Um, and, and they took it personally about everything that they were doing. If we, if we taught them how to do something, they were trying to do it exactly the way we asked them to do it uh, with some nasty and some grit. Um, you know, so and I and, and going through the season, what the reason you like an experienced offensive line is because you work all these different looks into your wide zone scheme, okay? Somebody's going to try to give you something different, right? But none of these guys had any experience in not only in the wide zone scheme, but also going to not playing time. I think they took 12, 12, 12 snaps. I think DT had 12 snaps. John Williams had 39 snaps, something like that. And you're looking at it, and I also, we were halfway through the season, I was like, I was like, Coach, we're going to be so much better next year because these guys understand all the calls that need to be made based upon uh, what they see. But we spent a lot of the summertime, we spent a lot of fall camp and spring ball trying to give them as many looks as possible to be prepared for anything that somebody could bring um, up front uh, to make sure that they could still execute. So from, from year one uh, to year two, I expect a big jump. And, and for me, mainly, uh, yes, being able to run the ball, being able to to be top five again is going to be tough. That's that's hard to do. Um, but being able to protect and run the ball, uh, we're expecting we're expecting the big jump. But I, but I, once again, just just on the leadership and the want to from the guys, not had nothing to do with me. 
the moment I walked in the door, they knew this is what they wanted to do, and they were out to, to prove some people wrong. Playing in the ACC, a lot of similarities to the Big 12, but was there anything that you guys saw this year in your first year going up against Big 12 defenses that made you think, you know, we might change this a little bit, or next year we want to make sure that we're doing this maybe a little bit differently, or, or is it pretty much kind of what you do is what you do across the board, not really dependent on what the league presents as far as defensively? Uh, Dave, I think it's a great question. Uh, I felt like – ACC, I thought the Big 12, to me, was was better competition, okay? I thought um, as far as how guys fit what we're trying to do, um, all of that uh, across the board, I thought was, was better competition going from um, the ACC to the Big 12. Now, ACC is still good. I mean, they're, they're, they're good ball players, good team. Uh, I thought schematically uh, the Big 12 does some does – some, real interesting things uh, that made me a better coach that I needed to adjust to. Um, but it's like it's like when you're playing against a triple option team, everybody puts in a different defense to play against it. And a lot of people will approach the wide zone the same way. So whatever you see, like the, the three or four games or six games, however many you break down, going into that game, you could see something completely different on game day because they have a plan on how they want to stop wide zone, right? So for us, the key is within that first drive, second drive, let's identify exactly what scheme this is and let's identify what, what we were talking about earlier, all your adjustments off that scheme so that you can be successful. Um, and I thought moving from the ACC to the Big 12, I thought the Big 12 guys had, had better wide zone adjustments um, than what I'd seen before in the past. How much does it help the longer you go now, you know, you've seen this team and, and it might be, it might get blown up because we don't know who the hell you're going to play. Right, right, right. With all the, the, I mean, we do know, but you know what I mean? Um, where the more familiarity that you, that you get, the more knowledge that you have going into a game plan that, okay, we have an idea of what these guys have done against us in the past where this year, like you said, the first drive or two, you're still figuring out, okay, what are they going to do? Right. And you know what's, you know, uh, the thing about that, Chad, is not just familiarity with them. The thing that's going to help us now is familiarity with our own team. We went through all spring, all fall camp with Jawan Briggs and Dante Corleone and Malik <laughs> Van kicking the crap out of us over and over again. Aaron, it's that, and Coach Sass, like, what, what are we doing? Can we not block them? Can we not block them? And so we're coming out of fall camp. Everybody on staff, everybody on the offensive staff will tell you, we had no idea if, if we were going to be worth anything up front. We didn't. We, just, we didn't know how good we were going to be because you're going against such elite talent at D-line over and over again every single week. And I'm like, <laughs> Coach, like, Coach is like, block them. I'm like, Coach, we can't block them. Like, I don't, I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. We're doing everything that we can. And, um, you know, so then you get into some of these games and we're moving the ball. I mean, you go against Pitt, who's who's known to have one of the greatest – a great defense. Uh, we we spit a huge run early in the game, and, and I'm like, did that just happen? Like, you're like, you know, all that stuff. All that stuff starts to fall into place. But, yeah, having familiarity going against some of these other teams will help. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that's going to help us in this offseason is knowing what we've got. At least for me, I know what I've got in my room. Um, and, and knowing what we've got to develop and, and what what can we be really good at offensively. You have a couple of young guys in Ethan Green and Evan Tangasol that – what was their growth like as, you, as young guys in this system for the first time from when you got them to probably where you are now? And do you see them putting themselves in a position to, to push for playing time in the fall? Yeah, so, so what we do on, on Sundays, we practice on Sundays. Chad's uh, usually sitting over there sleeping. We knew there that one was coming. <laughs> there it is. There it is. He said, "There it is." There it is. <laughs> I caught you. I caught you one time. You might have been looking at your phone, but I caught you one time. You're like, "No, no, I was not asleep." I don't think I was. I mean, I'm, that's not to say I've never dozed off at a practice before, but I <laughs> <laughs> at that time I don't think I because I. If one thing you know about me, I will own it. If you caught, yeah. I'll be like, "Yeah, yeah you got me." Yeah. 
I don't think I, I don't think I was. I might have been. I'm not going to rule it out, but I don't think I was. So on Sundays we'll, we'll practice, um, and I get a little bit more time with the young guys to to work with them and to develop them. We also rotated uh, uh, Tangital uh, and Green down there um, on the scout team and with us. So I got to work with them in in team segments as well. Um, I, I think they're going. They got a great future here. Um, Tangital is very strong at the point of attack. He's going to be. I think he's going to be tremendous for us. Uh, great kid. Awesome family. Uh, Green's going to be good for us. Great length. He's figuring out his body. Like I say, he's getting up to 300 pounds. Um, the CMO transfer, Philip Wilder, is a good football player. He rotated in um, during games this year. Um, I'm excited about him uh, and the nasty that he brings to it. He's gaining some weight too. Uh, Y'all hadn't seen Judea trans. Uh, sorry, he came in from a JUCO. Um, he's a, he's going to be good. Thanks. So what? Yes, I've heard good things. Yeah, yeah, he's a really good pass protection, and he's picking up on it. Uh, so we have some young, talented guys, and to me, I, I believe the the future is bright for that uh, for that room. But those two guys that you that you brought up uh, definitely got an opportunity. You you didn't, or I should say, not didn't haven't added any linemen to date from the portal. We know how how that all all works. Were you looking hard, or is that a tougher thing when you're when you're bringing back starters and guys are in the portal or obviously looking for playing time, and there's only you know one right tackle spot or one center spot? So, is that something that you're always kind of looking at just to see if you have a relationship with somebody? But it was a, it was a tougher deal just because of where you guys stand. Yeah, I think that's a great question that that not everybody kind of knows what what goes on behind the scenes. There were several guys that they got in the portal um, that we uh, called about that were interested in, um, and they didn't fit my. They didn't fit our room. They didn't fit our room uh, with, with their with their character, um, with who they are. Um, and, and when you got a room like what we've got going on right now with great leadership, um, you don't want to you don't want to mess it up uh, by adding somebody who's uh, a questionable uh, character guy. So we looked at a lot of those. Um, obviously, we had some other immediate needs uh, that we needed to take care of. Um, what we're looking, I'm not looking for somebody who could come in and start. And, um, you know, I think i think most people knew that because we have five guys coming back. Um, we we're looking for, you know, a guy that's got multiple years uh, that can play down the line. And uh, those things are hard to find in the portal. Most guys are like one year, they're one and done. If they're not going, if they're not guaranteed or told, that they're going to be a starter, uh, then they're not coming, and I'm not doing that. I'm not with the get with the guys that we've got that have worked their tail off to earn their position and and what they've done this past year. I'm not going to tell somebody that they've got a guaranteed spot. That being said, there's another portal window coming open after uh, after spring, um, and we will be uh, actively looking at offensive linemen. We're trying to find a tackle with multiple years um, is what we're is what we're is what we're shooting for. Uh, if we get that, great, because that's what we're looking for. Somebody down the line that can they can come in and be developed and play. Um, but an immediate need um, was not at offensive line right away. When you're recruiting high school kids who aren't playing in this scheme, what traits and abilities do you look at to say that this kid can translate into what we do other than, like, he's, you know, the – height, weight, speed type thing? Like are you, when you're watching them play a scheme that is not zone blocking, but you're like, this kid can do what we would want him to do. Well, I think our, our recruiting department does a tremendous job of identifying exactly what I'm looking for. Um, Zach Grant, Jack Griffith, Carter Wilson, those guys. Cass does a great job getting these guys going uh, recruiting-wise, and, and um, our, you know, our student assistant guys do a great job of helping identify what we need um, and it's athletic guys. Long athletic tackles is what you're looking for. For what I just told you, we're running off the ball, trying to display somebody. Uh, guys, they can run and they're fluid in their hips uh, at the tackle position, but have good length. Um, you know, there's a couple of times you're you're playing against some long guys and I'm, I'm asking the, <clears throat> the tackles, how's your block going? He's like, coach, I can't reach him. <laughs> He's just so long, I can't reach him. I was like, just stay on your angle and, and go. That's what you're looking at at the tackle position. And interior-wise, you're looking for A-gap bullies. Just bullies, mean, nasty, 
guys that want to bully people around. There's a certain, you know, you want to have some size. I'm not looking for the 320s to the 350s. I'm not. Our guys up front, uh, Kendra's a different animal. He's probably about 320, but he's a, a freak show. Um, but I'm not looking for, for big and sloppy. I'm looking for guys who are fluid and can run and who who has the frame to be able to fill out and, uh, and put on some size. Are you, you got, open, I'm sorry. Are, are you open to the development, like finding tight ends? Oh, yeah. Guys yeah. that have the 6667 yeah. body. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And we've done that a lot in the past. I think we've done it a lot in the past when I was at a group of five school. I, I think it's harder now at a power five school to say, I want to take this tight end unless he knows he's going to, he's going to, move towards the ball a little bit more um, to take him and say, hey, you're going to do this uh, and do that. We're, we we really want to try to find guys that are that are true tackles and have uh, that size uh, and length to them because I mean, you, you have got to have size. A long season, you got a 12-game season, and the thinner the guys are, the more likely they are to get injured, and you've got to have some, some, some thickness up front. You brought in three linemen in this 2024 class out of high school, Aiden, Jake, and Zach. Give us just a little bit about each of those guys and what, yep. what you like most um, about them, whether it's personality-wise or, or when you were recruiting them, what you liked uh, about what they, do, what they do on the field. I'll go in order of what you said. Aiden uh, won a state championship. Uh, he, is, he, is, he plays both sides of the ball. Um, he, you know, I know he's looking to gain some weight. He dunked a basketball, or ch- almost dunked a basketball, in a basket in a uh, his high school game uh, a couple of weeks back. He, uh, I think, he hit the back of the rim with it. But he's athletic. He can run. He played on both sides of the ball, and he has that that look in his eyes, like there may or he he may hurt somebody. Like he he looks like he wants to hurt somebody. When he was getting ready for the state championship game, he was like, "Coach, I, I'm just ready to go. I'm just ready to go." And I was like, man, I'm excited for you. Uh, but he has what you want. He's got that focus, uh, smart kid, hardworking. Um, but he's got that dog in him. He's got that dog in him that he wants to go out there and hurt somebody uh, on that football field. And uh, we're excited to get him in there. Uh, Jake Willock, uh, very fluid in his hips, has a, a ton of twitch, uh, good size, very smart uh, football player. Um Tremendous family. We, we have obviously he was our first commit uh, in this class. And uh, I mean, he's been awesome. He's already on campus uh, working hard, getting after it. And you can already tell he's going to be very, very bright uh, uh, football player. Uh, but he has some twitch and some punch. He's got he's got incredible strength uh, to him. Zach Clark, uh, great length uh, at the tackle position, but he's going to get some he's going to have some size to him. Um we believe he's going to be, you know, really, really good out there on the edge. Uh, man, I went out there, uh, watched his one of his high school games uh, out there in uh, Chicago. Ice cold. It was freezing. He had no sleeves on, and he's out there just putting kids in the dirt, trying trying to hurt somebody. And I was like, this is the kid that we want, you know. Uh, comes from also another great family, uh, smart kid. But he's like, he's he's one of the guys. I mean, he he likes to hang out with the boys and um and uh, but and work hard and we're excited about having. Him. Awesome, Chad. You got anything else for Coach? No, I've, I've chimed in when necessary. I think you know I, I, that's why we leave. Now you know why we leave the football questions to Dave. Yeah, <laughs> Dave loves talking ball. Uh, well, listen, I could talk ball uh, all day. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, you want to let us know who the new defensive coordinator is going to be? I have no idea. You can, you can break some news right now. I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You know what I've learned through the years, guys. This is what I've learned through the years. Stay in my lane. <laughs> not worry about not now. Now I, 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 you know, I talk to all the players. We hang out with all the players. You know, I like I like to do that. But when it comes to offensive line. I take care of the offensive line. I see something else going on that ain't got to do with me. I let I let, <laughs> I let I let the head man take care of the rest of it. Because uh, back when I was a young, I know probably people still think I'm young, but I try to tell my wife, 
I was like, you know, when I was coming up trying to get different jobs and then be an O line coach, I was like, babe, I'm just so I'm just so young in the industry. She's like, well, you're 35 or 36 at the time. She's like, <laughs> she's like, you're not young. And I'm like, babe, in the world of offensive line coaches, yeah, I am. Everybody, everybody likes to have somebody that's this this a little bit older and so Most horrible. no line coaches, you feel they've all been around for 20 plus years. Forever. Forever. You know? So you know, I know, you know it's 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 part of it. But back when I was young, I would I would say and think and do all these things. I've learned through through the years to stay in my lane, take care of the boys up front, try protect the quarterback, protect the quarterback, run the football, and recruit your tail off. All right. Well, That's when you it. find out. Hit you up, hey, Chad. There is a there's a really good chance that you find out before me. <laughs> That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I will tell you. I will say this. Uh, you know, before we get off here, I know Coach Satterfield is diligently trying to find the right person for for us. You know, uh, trying to find the right guy for our players and uh, for this university and for this program. Uh, there, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I, I'll tell you. In a lot of these, um, you go to all these clinics, these these football clinics. You know who these coaches want to work for? They want to work for Scott Satterfield because they know he's he's going to do things the right way and treat people the right way. And um, and you don't always hear that, you know. So I feel like we got a great opportunity to get somebody in here. It's going to be great, and uh, let's go win. Let's go win some ball games. We almost got Nico the other night. Nico said, uh, I think he said something along the lines of. It's a good list. He's got a good list. And I'm like, oh, so you've seen the list, huh? And then he clammed up. <laughs> That's a rookie move. Up. That's a yeah, rookie move by Nico. After that. That's a rookie move by Nico. <laughs> I'm like, I always, I listen, I've always been like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. List. What list? There's a list. What list? There's a list. Uh, we, oh, here we go. We got we got somebody. Coach, Coach, if you're able to get video of me sleeping in practice, the community would be ever appreciative. I'll bring my phone to practice. <laughs> I'll bring my phone to practice. And I'll see, see if I can the get thing that, Here's the thing that makes me think I wasn't. If I was sleeping, you probably would have caught me like this. If I was like this, like leaned over, yeah. I was looking at my phone. The, the, it, the issue is, is that you did have the arms crossed. You weren't here, but you were here. Yeah, maybe. Well, <laughs> here, you <laughs> Here usually leads to here, right? Like you, that's, you, where, you that's how there, it goes. And I was like, and I'm you know, you're you're always sitting over there where I'm running my drills, which I'm sure is I, I'm great, right, you're right in front of us. Great entertainment for you every single day, I'm sure. So I'm I'm here running my drills. And so I, I I'm I like I, I to me sometimes I have ADD, like there's always something going on at practice, and I got I'm watching, you know, with O Lyman, you gotta coach everything. Like if he breathes the wrong way, bro, hey, what are you doing? You know, like you got to be coaching everything. So I look over there at the corner of my eye and I look back again. I'm like, this man sleep. This man is asleep at practice. And you're like, hey, across, I definitely was not on my phone. No, but I will. I will now take my phone from the equipment guy and I'll say, I'm, I'm gonna now. If I get it, I will. I will expose you. You coach, you have my email address, so you can just make sure. Well, that, yeah, just just um, tweet it, tweet it at the Bearcat Journal Twitter account, and I'll I'll make sure to get that out to <laughs> send it directly to Aaron. Twenty thousand so, followers. So right before COVID, like remember how you guys had like everybody got like three or four spring practices in, then COVID yeah. hit, everything got shut down. This is like the the second practice, and they only had like three. So we're standing in the bubble on the sideline and I think it was Bruno LaBelle who was a 6'5 240 pound Canadian tight end love it comes comes running towards us on that the 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 near side of the bubble got it and I get the hell out of the way like I I'm I'm you know I'm not no. blowing out of me at practice today yeah so COVID hits, and like two weeks into COVID, I get a video sent to my phone from Luke Fickle. Yes. 
who was breaking down practice tape, edited that clip of me getting out of the way and questioned my commitment to the program because I almost let Bruno run into the wall of the bubble where he could potentially have, you know, got a boo-boo on his shoulder. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so you've I'm been you've been around. exposed before. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Not not publicly. This not, we, not we, publicly. We, that, that, was, that was just sent to his phone. Right. Yeah. Right. But I made it public. We yeah. need like I said, I'll own it. I'm telling you right now, evidence. if you caught me like this, yeah, I was sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and, and one last thing I know I, I gotta go. But I love the fight of the Cincinnati Bearcat basketball team last night. It was great. Oh my gosh! It's great. I mean, who's uh, Newman? Yeah, playing defense. Yep, all over. Him. He all has over been him. unbelievable. Well, you got you got a big big one Saturday for you and uh, maybe some future Bearcats to attend. I so. Hope so, yes, sir. We are bringing some future Bearcats to that game. And I'll be screaming. I'll bring my son. He likes to take his shirt off and, and swing it around. <laughs> Uh, Let's go. He wants to go on the jumbotron. He got on the jumbotron during the football game, doing the gritty. And he, like, <laughs> Dad, we were on the we were on the jumbotron. I was like, that's great, awesome. <laughs> oh, kids, good times, man. Kids. Good times. All good right, man. Well, you have you have been more than kind with your time. Uh, Zach Stipe said thirty minutes. We kept you a little longer. No worries. We're good. All right. Well, you you get some nice sleep up there. Don't go outside. You ain't got to tell me twice. <laughs> <laughs> Order some Uber Eats or like some DoorDash if you're hungry. No doubt. There's like an Outback within walking distance, but still. Yeah, I might I might still Uber Eats it and just have them <laughs> bring it <laughs> across bring the street to, to me yeah. for five dollars. <laughs> no doubt. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Thank All you, right, coach. man. We'll talk to you soon, coach. See you, See you man. He was done with us. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Big time. That, that yes. You got you you have been asking for him for a long time. Yeah. I like I like and, talking offensive line because it's the position I think I know the least about, and that's not saying much. I mean, I don't know a ton about the other positions either, but <laughs> you know, when you when you watch a whether it's a football game or a basketball game, you're drawn to the ball. So right. you're not necessarily paying that close of attention you're not watching what the five guys are doing you're watching what the quarterback is doing or what the running back is doing so i think it's it's always helpful to to talk offensive line because that's where it starts and none of that other stuff can happen without them working as one so getting an idea of, of what that means in the zone blocking scheme and what they're tr what what, it, what they're trying to do and what each guy is you know, trying to be, become better at it and what they're trying to become better at as a unit uh, is is very entertaining to me and I'm sure uh, insightful to a lot of other people as well. I, I'm for a fan. I think it, for me, it would be refreshing to hear him acknowledge we got to get better in pass protection. Like, yeah. I, I think we I think we got really good and we learned how the, the wide zone scheme and we did what we needed to do. But to get where we want to be, pass protection wasn't there because that means what we're all seeing, we're all seeing it. I sure. I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't going to be rude and be like, you guys stunk pass blocking last year. How are you going <laughs> to fix it? Uh, that, you know, that would have been rude and uncalled for. But it, it is nice that he, you know, talked about that and. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, if you're going to be on here and say that we watched every rep and, and we're assessing every little bit of it, it's, it's pretty impossible to just gloss over that fact of that they were, you know, for the most part, and he even acknowledged in the run game needing to be better on, you know, third and short. And in, in those crucial situations, yeah. uh, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to just gloss over that you know, a, a bigger issue last year when it came to offensive line was certainly the inability in key situations to to block when you needed to do something down the field in the pass game. So, yeah, it was uh, – I always like talking to the coaches. I think we 
we are very lucky one that we are even allowed to have them on and two you know very few times have i been done with this and been like that you know i don't even know if there has been a single time but where you know you don't feel like you got i had a good conversation and and got a good understanding of what they're trying to do and who their guys are and and good you know behind the scenes stuff into the program and hopefully you learned a little something that's right the, that's the key that's right all right. Anything else football related you want to uh, you want to get to right now? I mean, I I have not. I don't know if you guys have. I have not really discussed Coach Brian Brown leaving. Um, Go ahead. He, I mean, him going back to Ole Miss. That's kind of a no brainer. Like, uh, especially with what they're trying to do this upcoming season. Uh, they are very very much a playoff potential type of team. They have certainly uh, spent that way in the portal. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, having that opportunity, going back to your alma mater, being a co-defensive coordinator with Pete Golden, who is a pretty darn good defensive coordinator, was at Alabama, has now been at Ole Miss. I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong. I don't think this was his first year. It might have been, but one or two years. Um, but I also, you know, if we're being honest about it, I think that scheme left, in my opinion, a lot to be desired last year. I was 100% for it. Um, I've always felt pressure is essential in college because for the most part, I don't trust college quarterbacks to be able to process and handle it. Um, but outside of the pit game, there really was not a lot of boom in the boomer bust philosophy of 40% pressure rate. So, and, you know, is, are they going to go in a similar fashion? I don't know. I, I can't see them deviating too, too much um, because then you're, then you're crossing the line into personnel potential sure. pers personnel issues. Um, yeah, you're not switching to like a, th you know, a totally different front. And now you're going to have those guys that you've recruited or brought, you know, brought in that are not fit right. for that. Um, but, you know, you can't blame it. Yeah, you know, I think it's foolish to blame last year's defensive efforts all on the players. Um, so, but even if you want to, like, you still have to be in control of the defense and be able to make adequate changes that, I mean, to be honest, Dave, I don't, I don't think, I think after they figured out they, they, they had the, the dreaded dual issue of like not having, you know, like a, a, a real legit edge rusher right and a bad secondary they were playing a ton of drop eight like i don't even know how much of sure. Brian brown's quote-unquote defense that we actually saw yes i i don't disagree with that um but i i guess and, just, and, and that, you had to do that because guess what they couldn't get to the quarterback right and and they couldn't cover sure so i i mean i guess really what i'm i mean i'm just i'm look i'm interested to see the direction they go and what changes, if anything, from just a pure scheme standpoint? Like I think, I think the portal has raised the floor of the defense. I'm not going to put like a a number on how much could, without seeing any of these sure. guys in play for UC do things that UC is asking them to do. But I think the overall talent level and athletic level of the defense has been raised. So. The hope is that, you know, you get some percentage better in the pass rush and some percentage better at covering, and they work much more in tandem in 2024 versus 2023, and you can have a a pretty solid defense. And I think that that's – I mean, if they had a pretty solid defense 
and had more consistent quarterback play last year without turning the ball over. Um, I think they're a, a much different team than they were. And I think both of those yeah. things, I think both of those things can, can be remedied, you know, relatively easily here. I mean, I think we've talked about it before, but like, it's not like we're going to be asking to guys to do things so far and above and beyond the realm of possibility to have, to make a significant jump from, from year one to year two on the defensive end. Yeah. So it'll be, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, not, I mean, you, these things, they are not like head coaching searches. Like I, I need people to understand that, <laughs> that head coaching searches, everybody's talking. Like everybody wants, you know, my phone is blowing up from people I haven't heard from in three, four years wanting to know what I'm hearing or, Hey, have you heard, you know, trying to get this guy interest and trying to get that guy, you know, like that's just how co head coaching searches work. Assistant coaching searches, the job becomes available and everybody goes underground almost like nobody wants to let anything out. Um, so it's not always the easiest thing to, uh, to distinguish until they narrow it down. And then hopefully you kind of get a feel for, for who the final candidates are, but the early stages are difficult. Yeah. Matt wants to know, Dave, who's your number one choice? Oh, for DC. Oh God. I mean, honestly, I'm not, I'm not even sure I've like thought about it on that level yet. Just because it's, I feel like it's so, it's very scheme specific. I feel like, like you as a head coach, you have a way that you envision your defense being. So, like, are you going to bring someone in that either let's just either has never run the scheme that you've always ran? Because, like, there's going to be some trust understanding in how that yeah, sure. works or someone who's never run a defense period. Um, so I, I don't even know if I've looked at it in the sense of like top choice, second choice, third choice type of thing. Um, I mean, I think I'm looking at it more of like maybe more on the, positional development part like has, what position has this person typically coached and what kind of production has have his players got um in that what in that regard because I, I kind of often feel like if you're if the position group that you focus on has been good then I'm, then your whole defense has probably been good yeah um, so, and I think, you know, I think if you, if you're looking to try to do a one-to-one -one thing, then you're looking at someone that has history coaching defensive backs as a whole safeties corner. I mean, who knows, but cause that's what coach Brown did. Um, if not, you're looking at shifting things around on, on your own staff. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to like put out any names of I hope they hire this guy. It's more so of a looking at positional development and and and, rec and, you know, and recruiting. I think defensively um I don't know if it's even like makes sense or fair to say like offense versus Steve. I feel like offense you can offense you can scheme stuff up better or more frequently and defense you just need to get the dudes. Yeah. So, so recruiting to me maybe has a little bit more weight on the offensive side of the ball versus or on the defensive side of the ball rather than than the offensive side. Um because in this case your head coach is also your play caller. So sure. I'm less less concerned about are all of the offensive coaches like the recruiter coaches? Or are they like the X's and O guys? Whereas defense, I'm like, 
you know, we need we need to go. Uh, Andrew, that made me laugh, but that is absolutely not the case um, because there's one thing that he has never done that would that gives me great pause. Um, <laughs> call so, defense. Call defense. You, I mean, let's be real. If you're Scott Satterfield and you just had a three and nine season, are you going to hire a defensive coordinator that you've never worked with, who's also never called a defense? No, I will say. No, I'm not uh, saying that it's like a total disqualifier, but right. thinking logically, would you do that? Would 95% of college coaches who are t- typically very conservative, would they do that? And guess what? If, if Scott Satterfield loses this job, there's a couple steps down that are coming. Like, that's just human nature. So you're going to have to go find what you believe is like plug and play ready, not uh, let's bring in a guy that's ready to grow into the role. Uh, But what I was going to say is I do think Freeman's defense that he is kind of created is not far off from what Satterfield wants to do. No, I mean, it's a, it's the true three, three, five. But um, aggressive. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, I mean, it was certainly from a pressure standpoint, it was certainly more in line with what Brian Brown did than what Mike Trussell did. Yes. Like that was the thing we always felt, you know, like watching the switch from Freeman's defense to Trestle's was they sat back a lot. Like they, they weren't, more, it was much more read your keys versus fire yeah. and, and be, co- be confident and see what happens. Right. So that's all I'll say about that. Like, I I do think it's a similar, it is not the same, but that's difficult to find, but they're not uh, different languages. I guess it's a good way to, a a good football term. They're like branches, branches, branches of the same tree. Tree, right. So they might be like in different parts of the tree. Sure. But they're on the same tree. That's a good way to put it, Dave. Well done. So I pay you the big bucks. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Anything else, football? Um, Alabama's finding out what everybody else has found out about the transfer portal and and what you know how the other it's not half fair, lives. Dave. That how is the, the other cry half, from Alabama fans. How the it's other half fair. lives? Oh, I saw so many tweets. These kids, they don't know what the meaning of of giving your word and you know all this sports just going to hell. You know, and yeah. they didn't mind when Saban brought in a the, the other team's best player. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's uh welcome welcome to uh welcome to college football 2024, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's something. Yeah, but no, um, I mean Quite a, you know, as one would expect, quite a domino effect from Coach Saban leaving, and we still could have another one if if Jim Harbaugh were to to leave. I mean, I, I personally love Sharon Moore, but he's going to be tied into all of that stuff. And are they going to be, you know, if if something were to come from the NCAA, are they going to? be able to hire him do they want to hire a first year a first time head coach um there will certainly be a uh, i would imagine quite a list of of potential uh candidates who would be interested in in coaching the reigning national champions (laughs) so uh we shall see but uh it certainly feels like jim is you know he's interviewed for two teams that we know about and uh, maybe some others that we don't so it certainly appears like he is um, interested in going to the league. Now he has done this last year with the Vikings. It got very far down the line. Uh, he's, cer- he's certainly playing both sides of it, trying to get sure, trying to get immunity out of Michigan. I mean, he's got an eleven million dollar contract sitting on his desk that he won't sign yet because he's trying to get hundred percent immunity from being responsible if anything blows back on them from any of this 
stuff, whether it's the Connor Stallion stuff or whether it's the the real thing that they're actually in tr- probably going to be in trouble for from the NCAA is all the illegal visits and stuff that they did during COVID, which no one is talking about anymore because the Connor Stallion stuff was so ridiculous and so, you know, uncharacteristic or not heard of. But the stuff that NCAA wise that would probably get him in the most trouble is the COVID violate COVID year violation. Natalie said she needs a big stack of napkins from quick paper su- supply to dry her tears for Alabama. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, as a Tennessee fan, I am, it's, <laughs> it's, it's such a shame what's, what's going on. I, I and we, we we play Alabama on Saturday. I'm going to the game. So uh, it's just some, some great symmetry right now for, for those fellows down in T town. Really, really, <laughs> really feel for them. Yeah. I imagine you feel, you feel very bad. Yeah. Awful. I mean, we had a coach that gave out cash in McDonald's bags. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> All right. That'll wrap up football. Oh, well, Matt, Matt uh, did ask where there'll be two junior days. To my understanding, there will be. We'll have more on that. I'm still waiting to find out what the exact definition of the 27th is because there's not a basketball yeah. game, right? Yeah, no, they, they play um, UCF, UCF at home. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Look at look at so me they, knowing look at me knowing who they play like three games from now. Right now, my knowledge <laughs> stops at Kansas. Like, get to Kansas, go to the game, get in the van, get the whole crew back, and then we'll worry about what happens. Yeah, you because know, then you get like a six day break, right? Like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because like you're not playing. We- you're not playing Wednesday, so or Tuesday, so yeah, you're going right. Monday to Saturday. These first six games have been complete tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. Whatever happens after Kansas, I haven't even – because, look, let's – this timestamp brought to you by Turtles Brew. Zero sugar, zero carbs, gluten-free, 6% ABV, bourbon-infused sweet tea. They have lemonade tea, cherry lime, strawberry mint, raspberry peach, orange vanilla. There's 100 locations in Ohio. Visit turtlesbrew.com. For more information and locations, a uh, portion of the proceeds go to save the sea turtles. Um, I, Dave, the thing is, the first six games are, were all that – because if they started one and five, oh and right. six. Is this going to be brought to us by Team Ticker? Yeah, in one second. All right. I wanted to finish <laughs> my thought. I was already in the middle of a thought. I didn't want to do two ad reads and then get back to the thought. So <laughs> if they finished one and five or oh and six, the math was just like, you know, you got what you got. You're going to go eight and four over the final big 12 games, the final 12 big 12 games. You know how good you have to be in this league to have an eight and four stretch, like at any well, point in time. If you start zero oh and six or one and five, you're probably not good enough to then turn around and have and an go. Eight well, and eight. I'll argue with these six; like they're all ranked, they're all. Good. But you're still probably not going to turn around right. and do that. <laughs> no, no, I agree. But but that's 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 the reasoning behind. Nothing mattered until they got through the Kansas game for me. Sure. Um so let's uh let's let's before we get to that we'll talk about team ticker which as you can see right here boom it's a one of a kind sports sign for Bearcat fans. It's a high tech retro display that provides daily updates, the latest news, stats, schedules, much more no subscription required. You're looking for the perfect addition to your man cave, your dorm room, a special gift for that special Bearcats fan. Go to teamticker.com, pick up your team ticker today. If you use promo code BCJ, you get $50 off of your order. So there you go. There's there's the Sea Paul. Aaron's got the Bearcat. They are awesome. My dog still freaks out a little bit every time there's a game, Dave. <laughs> Like, you can see his head jerk, and he looks at the team ticker playing the fight song. Like, what? Uh, when we go to Pro Day, uh, we as long as schedules match up, yes. Um, 
that's always I'm sure either at, at minimum either I or Keegan will be there um but I don't know we haven't gotten a date for when that is and, and yeah. what the schedule looks like and all that stuff yet so I, I don't want to say for certain what the plan is because we don't have one yet uh because the way this stuff all works is you plan for like two weeks in advance and then you just start over when you get to the end of the two weeks. <laughs> um, that's why it was so important. Like they're, they're, they're not playing with house money yet, but getting at least two out of these first four Dave, was the, the minimum. Like you had to do it if you were going to stay afloat and they're there through four. Um, now you, you still got two really tough ones. Oklahoma is very good. And at Kansas is playing at Kansas. So the likelihood that they get to four and two is, is not great, but three and three is at least a, a solid possibility. And through these first four games, I think you more than anything have been completely validated for the last like three seasons of basketball podcasts. Why is that? Because the basketball sucked. Like, even if UC was okay, and they weren't, but even if UC was okay, it just wasn't any fun watching that league. The players were not like, just watch, go back and watch the shots Tennyson hit uh, for TCU last night. Go back and watch the shots Trevor Nell hit Why did, for BYU. Uh, real real like, quick on on Tennyson, why did his mother, father, whoever not name him Lord? I, I don't know. I, I haven't met them. That would have been so great as an athlete. Like Lord, Lord Tennyson yeah. for three. Right. <laughs> Missed it, opportunity. It, yeah. It, what, my joke on Twitter was always this conference. And now I can still use that joke, but it means something totally, totally different. So, yeah. I mean – I think last night's game, and I'm, I'll try not to be hyperbolic about it, like the most important UC win in five years? Maybe, yeah. I mean, again. The re my reason behind that is if you drop that game, like if you yeah, if the game you ends. You have and, to beat Oklahoma. And Ernest Udo makes one of those free throws and you lose another game like that. Yes, you have to beat Oklahoma, but where are your players mentally after a third loss like that? Uh, like, yes, it would be at home, and yes, we they very well, very well could win. But like, where? What is the state of the program mentally going into that game on Saturday if you had lost last night? Yeah. Because then you're again, you're at that point where all of a sudden, like you feel like you're just swimming upstream. Like it, 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 you've gone through four games in the league, and you know what your knowledge of the league is? My God, like this is a monster. Like your how, knowledge how to, of the league is is we're good, but we're not good enough to get it done. Right. And and you feel like the walls are closing in, and then you start pressing, and then you know you're you're not executing the way that you've been executing. Like it, it can snowball. A, a and now percent. the flip side of it is now we have a chance to do that thing. We always talked about in the big East, which was just have a winning week and yeah. your outlook changes incredibly. So you, you go from, you, you look at both sides of the spectrum are, are so like, you know, crystallized when you go from Jesus we were this close to being one in three facing another top 15 team and now we're man now we've got a top 15 team at home coming off of a win against the top 20 team and we've got a chance to have a winning week and not just a winning week but a winning week against two top 15 you know top 20 teams it it totally changes everything and you you win on Saturday, and the Kansas game is pure house money. 
Right. You can you can just go and play free. Go play it free because you know your your gauntlet is over. And yes, the teams they'll be playing after that are still still formidable. But it's like, and you hope that you don't take a breather almost because of of you're not staring at another top fifteen team. But like then you can actually like try to get into like a groove. I mean, I tweeted about it last night, and I know there's going to be multiple teams in the Big Twelve that face this. I looked at some, and a lot had three games. Starting with the BYU game, going through the Big 12 tournament, so over two months, they will not go, as of today, which, of course, that can all change, they will not go two games without playing a ranked team. They didn't go, they went two months without playing a ranked team in the AAC. And now they're not going to so, go two games. So you get the the Oklahoma-Kansas, like, Saturday-Monday thing. Then you get UCF. And West Virginia, uh, UC up at home, West Virginia on the road, and and then you get Texas Tech and Houston. And Texas that. Tech is the only undefeated team left in the conference at three and zero. Yeah, yeah, and they're playing Houston right now. Houston's up two halfway through the first half. Yeah, but game that's itself. What, that's what we want. The game itself. I got to be honest with you. I didn't watch much of the second half. I was busy playing a. Uh, Blue Panthers versus Warlocks basketball game with against Will. He is all of a sudden like super, super into basketball. We have like the the on the back of the door um, basketball hoop now that are way better than when we were kids. This has a metal breakaway rim. Uh, but I would, you know, I got to be honest. If they'd have lost that game last night, I'd probably come on here and been pretty pissed off <laughs> because. There was a lot of – there was still a lot of the same stuff that contributed to the Texas loss and the BYU – or in the Baylor loss, and they just – they're having a hard time right now for whatever reason, and it, it has a ton to do with the competition, I know, but they're having a very hard time right now building off of what they're doing good – Game to game. You know, turnovers were an issue. Then they fixed the turnovers against Baylor, but couldn't shoot. Then, you know, and then now last night, they're back to the 15 turnovers and the missed layups and the missed free throws. It's like they are good enough to be in all these games and good enough to beat a good TCU team, beat a good BYU team who destroyed Iowa State last night without Trevin Neal. Now. Now, what? yeah, whatever. But they're still, you know, they're still having these fits and starts of we fix one thing, like we fix our defense against BYU or against Baylor, and then in the first 10 minutes last night, it's like we we're right back to where we were a month ago and just not wanting to guard anybody. And then they somehow fixed it in game, which I was floored by. They, they were on they pace. Went, to, I did the math. They were on pace to score 170 points. <laughs> they went from awful to great in maybe the fastest like flip of yeah. a switch I've ever seen in game. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this last night. They scored 26 points in seven minutes. Which is, it, it felt like like two two plus points per possession, mm -hmm. and it probably was. Well, they yeah, made nine of their first ten doesn't, shots. Doesn't shoot and, threes go fifty percent on eleven or twelve makes. Right, it wasn't like they went two for four. So, and then you give up twenty six in the first seven minutes, and then the next thirteen plus minutes, you gave up seven. They went from, oh my God, like all of all of what the fears were at the end of the non-conference are coming true tonight. To they couldn't score. Like TCU just was completely discombobulated, and then they only scored nine points in the well, last nine minutes of the game. The problem in the first half was you did all that work, and you only outscored them two nothing in yeah. in one segment. It was yeah. still 26 to 18. 
But yeah, I mean, so the that, third that... segment, the from the under twelve to the under eight, uh, it was twenty six sixteen going into the under twelve, and then at the under eight, it was twenty six eighteen. I think that's that's got to be the. I mean, that's the frustrating part for everybody is you don't get a breather to figure some of this stuff out game yeah. to game, and you you have these lapses where like i said you play really really good defense against a i get i think at the time the best three-point shooting team in the country against baylor but you can't buy a basket then last night you revert back to your turnovers and bad defense figure that out but then you're still missing layups and missing free. so it's like they just i don't know if that's gonna fix itself i don't know if that's gonna be how the whole season goes I don't know if that's something that will help when they're not playing, you know, but even still, West Virginia, it's not like West Virginia and UCF are South Florida and Tulsa. Oh. They're, they're still quality teams. So you can't expect to just, oh, we're not playing Kansas. We're going to wipe the floor with these guys. Like that's a, that's a false narrative if that's what oh, you- anybody is thinking. I mean, the only thing looking like a "quote unquote" night off is Oklahoma State. Yeah, they're just—they're um, not very good. But, but other but than they that, still, they still have guys that if you don't play good, they're going right. to win, whether it's here right. or there. You have to play well every night, every night. So, um, but that, but that is also why when they win, I don't give a shit about all that stuff I just mentioned, <laughs> because in this league. I don't care how you got it done. Right. So, but but you still look at those things and go, we have bigger goals, we have bigger aspirations than just beating TCU at home. Like, we want to continue to get better so we can continue to win these important games and put ourselves in the tournament where then those things do matter. Right. I, again, I, I mean, everybody knows my thoughts on this by now. I, I think TCU is at near the top <clears> of the league. It's not maybe my favorite to win the league because I think because of their age and their experience and their ability to score, I think they're going to be the most consistent team in the league outside of maybe Kansas. I mean, they're, they're three of, of Miller, Tennyson, and Nelson are, are pretty damn good three. Yeah, and then PV, I mean, PV was the one that really got the the spark in that first half run. Yeah. So they got they got dudes. But Uday's yeah, good. I mean, Uday's he, good. You know that, that he's, he's they've got sure. I mean, he was a, at Kansas. I mean, he's great at his role. I mean, how many thunder oop dunks did the guy? I mean, I know three off the top of my head. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, when you've got guards and, and guys that are, can play off the bounce and spread the spread the floor, and then you have him coming in and, and flying in, absolutely. I Jamie was a little weird last night in the press conference, but uh, I, I just I think he's a really good coach. I've always had a ton of respect for yeah, him. He, he was he was real whiny last night. A little, I I, I don't, like. He's never been a good loser. I mean, who who is? But I yeah, don't... but but some guys handle it better than others. Yeah, I just thought he was like a little like over the top whiny about about the loss. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. I, I don't care. I, I probably would be too coming off of a week where we beat yeah two top ten teams and then and then get dumped on the road. Yeah. So. <laughs> um. John Newman, I have officially elevated him. I saw that to Rashad Bishop status. Played great. His like, it is it is such a necessity in a league like this that you have a guy like that on your team. You have to, yeah, <laughs> because everybody's got a stud. Everybody's got a. <clears throat> two, three, four, somewhere from, from two to four that is going to be able to light you up and is, you know, on preseason watch lists and, you know, 
guys that like every team has one. So you have to have a John Newman. And as we've gotten into Big 12 play, like he has taken it up two or three notches. And then he adds the offense uh, last night, like he did. And all of a sudden, like you, you feel you feel a little more comfortable about the things if he can I know he's not gonna do that all the time. It's not really like last night it was just flowing for him and he took advantage. You're but hoping to, that that, he's not needed to necessarily do that. But the, right, but what I'm getting at is if he can get to a point where he gets you nine, 10, 11 every night and then has those occasional nights, like less nights at six, more nights at 11. Sure. And then the when the occasional 20 hits, now you've got a guy that's averaging 12 on the year instead of a guy that's averaging eight. Yeah. So that I think hopefully is like the next progression, but, but I don't know how much like he defends so hard. Well, that's what I, that's what I mean. Like you're not more times than not, you are hope, hoping that you don't need that from him because you know what he's going to expend on the defensive end. How realistic is it to think that he's going to do that? Plus on a, on a night be have to be the focal point of your scoring. Like that's not, I don't know if that's a realistic ask. I think I think eight, nine, ten, like nine, ten, eleven. I think is a realistic ask. Yes, that I'm talking about like twenty repeatedly right. is not a realistic yeah, ask. Yeah. Sure, yeah, right. Because he get, he gets to the basket, he can hit a spot of three, he gets to the line. So yeah, there are many ways that he can get to to ten points. He's not a he's not a guy that is is strictly reliant on his jump shot needing to be on in order for him to be a contributor offensively. Correct. And he's a lot of fun to watch. And I, I just, fa I found myself once they settled down, I found myself watching him and Emmanuel Miller just like chase each other across the floor. Yeah. Cause those are just two dudes that, that like they, they play right. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel Miller's probably a little more naturally gifted yeah. than John but they both they both max out and uh you know that that's exciting um plus he's mentoring Josh Reed and it shows yeah like I, I've talked about that and I, I think Keegan's uh, starting to put a story together on that I think Josh went to John and said look like if defense is the way to play <laughs> I, I, I need some help, bro. Like defense is always the way to play. Most guys are just all reluctant to to throw themselves into it a hundred percent because they then in their mind they want to be the, the the scorer guy instead of the stopper guy. Right. And guess what? When Josh Reed has changed his mindset, now all of a sudden, instead <laughs> of it's Josh Reed is the guy that's gonna get his minutes cut, now you have to play him 17, 18, 19 minutes a game because He's that valuable. And like I said about last night, Wes talked about this after the Texas game, and I thought it was true. John was dead. Like, he, he ran 37, 36, 37 minutes chasing those guards around. And, and by the end of that game, he was gassed. Last night, including overtime, he played 32 minutes. And the only reason you can do that is because they felt comfortable saying, okay, take a breather. We'll put Josh in, and he can guard Emmanuel Miller. Mm -hmm. And that, as a coach, makes your life a hell of a lot easier where there was a lot of times at the beginning of the season, Dave, like we knew if you took John Newman off the like, John Newman was the only guy playing good defense for a while. And if you took him off the floor, then you have five guys that weren't playing good defense. Yeah. So it's really good to see for John. Like, I think people genuinely, and I get it. I understand why. I think people genuinely didn't believe when I kept saying last year, this team would be so much better if it had John Newman. 
Yeah. Oh, that's easy to say. He's not playing. No, like this is what he looked like last offseason. And he's finally, you know, back to that level. So uh, th- th- great for him. And then happy for Day Day. Yeah. Uh, we've talked. I hate that this fan base. I've already seen people start now. Now that Day Day has, has come around, people are starting to hate on Jameel. Because they, they have to have something to be angry about when they watch sports. Maybe, I, I don't get it. Maybe you play 30-something college basketball games and not every player is going to be awesome every time they're on the floor. And maybe Some guys you, might even be bad for two games in a row, Dave. I, I mean, take their scholarship away. <laughs> I mean, what are what are we doing? Well, why are you here if you can't if you're if you can't get your shit together for for two games? I mean, come on. There's 30 games. You can't be bad for seven percent of them consecutively. No, I. I mean, it's it's it is what it is. I don't tell anybody how to fan. I just laugh. I mean, it's part of the reason that I really am very very rarely on Twitter during any game of a team that I'm a fan of because. You know, in the first half, guy makes a couple turnovers in a row and he should never see the floor again. In the second half, he makes essentially the two game winning plays by hitting a three and and making two free throws and and it's it's you know, it's fine. Well, 47 minutes ago you wanted him to transfer to Alcorn State. And but now I'm just like like can can you just can you let it breathe? Can you can you watch a game? Which I think the answer is no. Can you watch no. a game without reaching for your phone every time something happens or doesn't happen that you think should or shouldn't happen? Like, can you just watch the damn game and enjoy the basketball game or the football game or whatever for what it is? And and sure, opinions are great. I love we have them. Fans have them. We have a message board. We wouldn't have a, a site if it wasn't for opinion. But like right. the, the constant immediate just 100 percent like definitive answer based on one there are like how many possessions in a basketball game a hundred no not a hundred usually like, 80? like 60 60 50, 70 60, 80 yeah. depending on like yeah, so this 80. one possession at the 11 and a half minute mark of the first half that is that is the game for this guy whoever that guy is like that is that's the game doesn't matter what he does the rest of the game. He has screwed the game up at this one <laughs> possession. I'm I'm just like I'm like how do you do it? How how do you enjoy it? How how yeah. does anybody take any pleasure in in firing off all these tweets and then seeing what happened at the end of the game and then compartmentalizing the the knee jerk reactions of the first half to like I what I said an hour and a half ago doesn't matter because we we just won. Well, it was that moment in time, Dave. It was that moment in time. I was really mad in that moment. Like, notice I don't put any updates on X or, like, timeouts. There, yeah. At timeouts, I know I've got, like, three minutes to, like, compose my thoughts, look at the stats, come up with a, a fire tweet. A find something that is, that is interesting, whether it's right. positive or negative, that, that, that this needs to continue or this needs to change. But, like, right. I just, you know. I don't, I I'm don't watching the game. Right. I mean, I'm getting, I get frustrated. Like I said, I didn't watch most of the second half because one, I was playing a game, but, but two, I was like frustrated with a lot of the first half of it being like a repetitive thing of a lot of the same issues that had been happening uh, in other games. But I'm not like, do it. I'm not. I just don't see the point in in it all. Like I don't know how people, you know, you enjoy it, and but you know, it's it is what it is. It's it's the nature of of the sport any of sports anymore, and and social media. But like it's a it's it's quite a thing in college basketball, especially for me. In that like football, there is at least that like. 20, 30 seconds in between plays where you can kind of analyze what just happened and yeah. and say, like, that could be a definitive thing. Like, that could be, like, a pass is missed 
or a turnover happens, and and like that could that could legitimately matter for the rest of this game. A turnover at, at the fourteen minute mark is is legitimately probably not going to matter at the end of the game. Like there are going to be so many other plays that will determine how this game ends up. Um, Todd, yes, I have no damn idea what happened at the end of the game with the referees stopping the game after the first free throw attempt. I did not know that that was a thing. Um, I didn't know you could do that because the only way that you can do that, right. Is the other coach, Jamie Dixon had to try to so, point yeah. something out to them, Yeah, which that's you should not be able to happened. do. You should not be able right. to do that. The ball is essentially in play for two free throws. Right. So I no clue what that was. Um, but but other than that, like they let him play maybe two. <laughs> they were bad level. both ways. Like Amy well, Connor is not good. It was an incredibly physical game, which I am all for. But yeah, let that, play. That, there also has to be a point where it's like it's so physical, like you're well legitimately in, impeding the other team from from doing things which you should not be allowed to do. You also should be able to catch very simple stuff like a guy is standing out of bounds. And then he jumps in the air, catches the ball while he's in the air, and lands. And that's not a turnover. <laughs> I, I That must have happened when I wasn't watching. No, it was right at the end. It was like the final minute. Oh, oh. Jameer Nelson baseline is out of bounds. There's a loose ball. He's in the air, jumping back in bounds, catches it, lands in bounds. It was one of those... Well, yeah, like offensive had, rebound possessions at the he end. He hasn't uh, reestablished position. Right. He has to land and then catch. Right. But the ref was standing right there looking at it. And he didn't make a call. Where's Mo Egger? Uh, sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> I don't know where Mo is. How would I know where Mo is? He doesn't live here. He might be at home. I don't know. Is there a, is there a local basketball game that he might be at tonight no you see an ex played last night so i would guess mo's at his house enjoying time with his wife and his child <laughs> would you like him on the show chris would you like me to text him and see if he'll join us mo, are, you, are you busy <laughs> um but no i mean but that's the thing is like all that stuff to me kind of goes out the window when you win a game like that yeah um, you know, you just don't. As a fan, I'm. I don't worry about all that stuff that annoys me during the game because you got the win, and and in these situations, that that's all that really matters. It's it's up to Wes and the guys and everybody involved to to figure out a way to not have these moments where we do something good, but then something that we had been doing good now becomes something we're not something doing. Something we're doing bad. Right. Yeah. Because that's not. That's not a, you're not going to like, that stuff is not going to even itself out. Like if you keep playing like that, you're going to be in a lot of games like they've been in the last three games, but you're going to lose the majority of them. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to text Mo at 10 o'clock <laughs> on, a, on a Wednesday night. May, if you guys want Mo, I'll see if Mo will join us here sometime soon. I would like to hear Mo's thoughts on this. Should, should we talk about the... The travesty that was the court storming. Oh, bro, oh, grumpy old man, grow the fuck up. <laughs> Not me. You saw what me. was the travesty? Oh, I'm being facetious. That okay. they, uh, I said okay. after the game. I don't know if you saw storm this. The you, storm the court. Well, I said this after the game. You were probably doing media, so I don't know if you saw this. I said they should storm the court after every win, regardless of opponent. Just for the rest of the time. Just be the be the school that like we celebrate every win, like it's <laughs> like it's because I'm I'm you know I'm the I'm the fun guy like I want right. whatever whatever it has to do with it if it, if it's fun I'm for it and does everybody was having fun so I think they should be the school that no matter whether they're playing Kansas or Winthrop if you win at home you storm the court. One, I don't think they storm the court because they beat TCU specifically. No. I think they storm the court because one, it is very easy to storm the court at Fifth Third Arena now. 
Yeah, there's not a lot of resistance. <laughs> it used to be on right the, the, the bleachers didn't go all the way to the ground. They were like two feet off the ground. Yeah, you either and had then to there was like a, a three feet through, railing. Yeah, go through a gate or jump over like a six foot railing. So you couldn't really storm the court back then. Now there you literally can kind of sit kumbaya on the floor. Mm -hmm. Now I know they put up some temporary uh like smaller like what, fencing, like, right? Like movie theater stanchions, like the little like the not the ropes, but like they have put up something right at the first row that like is at least supposed to be a little bit of an impediment. <laughs> But sure. it's you can just step right over it. Like, it's not substantial. Like, the other ones, that stuff came up to, like, your nipples at Fifth Third Arena. Oh, it was three like, It was three, three rails. Yeah. Like, that was, like, you could, it, that was not fun to get over. So that's why you never saw a court storming at, at the old arena. No. Here, it's on the ground. Like, they're right there. So, like, if you get that excited, and I think that's what it was, it was it was a you know the second straight really tense game. You have a bunch of students. Think about this, Dave. They stunk for four years. Yeah, I just no, I, none of those students have had any fun like that ever before. You know, you obviously don't want to have it. You don't want to have anything to do with the opposing team. Like you know, just celebrate, have fun with your own people, and I see very little little harm in it. I did the math last night. Uh, if they win 25 games and storm the court and we're fined 25 grand each time, it's only 625,000. And they're not getting fined in non conference games. So it'd really only be in Big 12 games that you're probably getting fined because who's fining you in a non conference game? So, from what I was told last night after the game, because I asked about it, um, essentially it's a judgment call by the Big 12. And if they feel you did all you could to prevent it, then there's no fun. Like if you had measures in place and you had security in place and they yeah. still like they're not the big 12, at least they have a brain and like, we're not going to find you. Uh, it's not, for, it's not unilateral, just like no matter what. Right. Right. So like they'll look at it and they'll, they'll determine if Cincinnati had the right measures in place and then we'll see if there's fine or not. But just keep doing care, it. Man. Saturday, Saturday yeah. beat Oklahoma, storm the damn court. <laughs> that I, I heard a send bunch it, of uh send them to the send them to the SEC with a with a nice court storming. I'm for it. They are uh is that over yet? They were up big last time I saw it. Yeah, they're up six they're up Oklahoma's up 68-53 at home on West Virginia with 251 to go. Oh god, Dave. Is UCF beating Texas? They have outscored them 41 to 24 in the second half. Last time I UCF, saw it, they were down five. UCF is up 71 68 with 39 seconds left at Texas. <laughs> They're going to beat Kansas and Texas back to back. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they lost. Uh, uh, did they lose? They lost over the weekend. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. They're up five now with yeah, 39 seconds. BYU beat them 63-58. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, they're up They're up five with uh, – I wonder if they're just stay, staying in Texas because they go to Houston next Saturday. No. You're not staying Wednesday to Saturday. That's too long. Yeah. They have quite a stretch, though, coming up. Yeah. At UC, and Baylor, Oklahoma – at Texas Tech, at BYU. Everybody has. It's funny that some of the metric stuff came out today. Um, and Cincinnati now has Cincinnati, Cincinnati now has the 12th hardest remaining schedule in the Big 12 remaining. Oh, for the okay. next, well, what for was the, it before? Like the 13th? Well, no, because it's like Everybody was obviously about the same coming oh, in. Oh, just in, you mean just in the Big Twelve? In the Big Twelve, they, they because they played four of the ranked teams already. Right, the the remaining schedule now, could possibly be that. Is hard. <laughs> so, like, I think BYU. I think it was I, what I think it was was counting remaining quad one games. 
I think BYU has like 10 or 11 quad one games remaining on their schedule. Cincinnati only has eight. Yeah. Well, we're not going to like, cause we, we only play Kansas once. We only play Baylor right. once. We only play right. Texas. Texas, not a quad one right now. Um, they surely won't be if they lose tonight. Um, but then they only play Texas Tech once. Like they, they BYU. Up, yep, BYU. So they they kind of as as gauntlety as it is, they still kind of got a pretty favorable Big Twelve schedule. That's why we talked about it was so critical to get through this first six games with a couple wins, because things don't things aren't easy. But they are crazy. They're certainly going to be easier than some of the other teams. Yes. So, I don't know. All right, man. You got uh, you got much else? Um, I saw our friend this weekend. How, how was how was Mr. Simon? He was quite quite well. He did he did he did quite well for himself at the craps table. <laughs> Uh, that's not me speaking. I, I did no, okay. Dan Simon, you were yeah. there with him. I did okay at the blackjack table. He did he did quite well at the at the craps table. Um, yeah, but it was uh, if anybody goes to Vegas, check out the Red Rocks Casino in Summerlin. It's like 15 minutes northwest of the main strip. It is it's quite nice. Uh, hotel casino had a had an enjoyable time there. Is that where you stayed? It is. Much nicer rates, I would assume. Mm, it was on the company. I wasn't really concerned yeah. about the rates. But, I mean, I don't know. If you're, you don't have to be concerned to know what they were. <laughs> I, I actually don't. I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, compared to the strip now, probably. I mean, geez, that's still expensive. But It's crazy. Um, that's why my brother and I are going to Reno for the first and second round of the tournament. <laughs> uh, but yeah. It was uh, it was it was a fun time. Dan Dan is in good spirits. He he sends his best and hopes to uh, see everybody soon. All right. Well, uh, let him know that we miss him, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to him here in the near future. That's going to wrap it up. Huge thanks to Nick Cardwell. That was uh, that was a great another great interview here on BCJ. And uh, tomorrow, stay tuned. I will uh, be linking up again with Chris Lepore for another film breakdown. And we will take a look at, uh, I think we're going to look, Dave, how about this? You ready? Free throw defense? Late game offensive situation. So okay. from, I mean, you know, Baylor, where it didn't work, and then TCU where it did. So uh, I think we're going to do some of that and then take a, a brief peek at Oklahoma and we'll see what Chris can get to uh, maybe take a brief peek at Kansas. Yeah, I know very little about Oklahoma. I feel like I know the, maybe the least of, about them as uh, some of the, most of the team. I'm fairly there with you. I think some of it, Dave, is just they're leaving. Like I, <laughs> I, yeah, they were expected to be bad, and they turned out to be really good. But I, I didn't watch them early because they weren't like on the radar of a team that was supposed to be like top of the conference type good. No, um, name blast from the past. Name that is a sooner is John Hughley. Yeah, I him and Z or him and and Jamil, I could see. Like cheek to cheek at some point Saturday. Yeah, they have 17 turnovers tonight. I'm not sure if they're turnover prone, but even in a in a what is going to be a fairly easy victory, uh, you know, turn the ball over quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, UCF wins 76 71, and Houston up 37 29 on Texas Tech. Aaron and Here, I. Will talk about here's uh, Texas's next six games: Baylor, at Oklahoma, at BYU, Houston, at TCU, Iowa State. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. That one kind of 
in the moment stung because I I was I was optimistic that Disu was going to make them better the the farther along he got. But that's not a super talented Texas team. No. I mean it's essentially they, two it's essentially two guys. Yeah. And Mitchell cleans up the scraps and is great in transition. That's basically yeah, their and team. Caden Caden Shedrick's good. He didn't play against you. Right. Um, I don't know if he played. But, I don't know if he played tonight or not. So. But I I didn't get the feeling. I like I wasn't bullish on Texas. Yeah. You know who I'm not bullish on as we get out of here. Uh, UCLA. They beat Washington. Uh, well, last they're, getting, week. they're getting pounded by Arizona State tonight. Are they? <laughs> I don't like Bobby all that much. I like Danny a lot. I love Danny. I don't really like Bobby. Yeah. Well. It's, it's Losing to Danny, you can stomach. Losing to Bobby. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to wrap it up. Appreciate everybody for watching. Again, thanks to Nick Cardwell. Uh, we'll see you next time. It's the BCJ Podcast brought to you by the Holy Grail right here on BearGuyJournal.com.